recording this because the first week is very important. So if we have students joining us next week, I want them to be able to go back and review this week's lecture. Uh, so British important writers' works. Uh, you know, there are a lot of British writers, and a lot of them are very important. So I kept thinking when I was writing this course, uh, among so many important British writers, who should we study? You guys just finished a semester of British literature, yes? Right? Uh, and then uh, our department also offers Shakespeare, if you're interested, and uh, British poetry or English poetry. So I thought maybe we can read something that these three other courses don't cover. Uh, now, because this is not exactly a literary history course, when you were studying British literature last semester, uh, some focus was on the history, the development of British literature. But this course is not a history course. It is a literature course. Uh, so we will only be focusing on the text itself. The text. Uh, if you don't know, this is the Norton Anthology of British Literature. It has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15 editors. And this is volume 1. Uh, fortunately for you, we will not be reading all of this. In fact, we will not be reading most of it. Uh, we will be reading mostly three important British texts. Uh, and you won't have to buy this. I will prepare handouts for you. Uh, in fact, the first text has already been prepared. It's not that thick. It's OK. It's like 30 pages. Um, the first text, starting next week, is uh, Christopher Marlowe's play, Dr. Faustus. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about Marlowe later, because I'll give you a, a more in-depth introduction to prepare you for next week. We will spend three weeks on Marlowe, and then we will spend three weeks on the next text, which is Paradise Lost by John Milton. Uh, Paradise Lost is the most famous English language text of the 17th century. Uh, you guys did not read this, right? The reason you did not read it is because it is a poem of around 12,000 lines. And so it's not easy to assign in a course that is supposed to cover all of British literary history. Fortunately, we are not covering all of British literary history, so we can spend a bit more time on this poem. Now, what does 12,000 lines look like? About that thick. This is around 200 pages. Uh, but again, I'm not going to uh, make you read all of it. As the schedule says, we are reading selections. Uh, and I have already made those selections. They total up to around 1,400 lines. Not too bad, around four to 500 lines per week. Uh, and even better, it's not one of those like abstract, uh, like very touchy-feely metaphor-filled poems. It's a story. And the paradise that is lost is the Garden of Eden. This is the story of how Satan seduced Eve into eating the forbidden fruit and thereby lost humanity paradise, paradise lost. Um, the interesting thing about this poem, though, is that for much of the poem, the protagonist is not humanity. It's not Adam, not Eve. It's not even God. The protagonist is Satan. 
he, Satan becomes almost the hero of the poem. And so that should be quite interesting for us to be. Um, you may notice that the uh, division of how much we're going to read each week does not look very equal. For instance, week two, it says Dr. Faustus scenes one to four. Week three, we're reading scene five. And then week four, we're reading scenes six to 13. And that's because scene five is very long. So if you look at the page count, it's about the same for each week. Same for Paradise Lost. Uh, book nine, which is uh, week six, is the book that deals with the specific action of Satan seducing Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, and then Eve gives the forbidden fruit to Adam, which is like really important. So we're going to read more from book nine than from the other books. And that's why the division looks a bit unequal. But in fact, it's, I tried to make it as fair as possible. Uh, week nine is the midterm exam. Uh, we're not going to do that in class. That will be an online exam. It will be open book. You can use whatever resources you want, except you may not ask other people. You can ask me, you can write me an email, you can ask me questions, but you cannot ask anybody else. You can use the internet, use the dictionary, use the handouts, use your notes, go to the library, anything you want except for other people. Now, since I've given you so many resources, I can't give you a very easy exam question. Uh, so I'm not going to just give you two hours. I'm going to give you one week to answer this question. Uh, because it is midterm week, uh, I suggest that you begin with this course's exam before you get into uh, the actual midterm week. Otherwise, uh, you know, um, might be Monday midnight, you suddenly remember, oh no, you have another exam you need to do online and you won't have time enough to finish it. So I suggest you do this course's exam first. And the midterm will cover these two texts, Dr. Faustus and Paradise Lost. After that, uh, week Weeks 11 to 16, we'll be reading a Jane Austen novel called Persuasion. Uh, we're not going to read Pride and, Pride and Prejudice. We're not going to read Sense and Sensibility. These are two most famous novels. Uh, because some of you, I hope, may have an interest in literature and may even have an interest in Jane Austen. And if you are interested in Jane Austen, those two novels will be the first two Jane Austen novels you will read. In this course, I wanted to, uh, for us to read something a bit different. So we're going to read Persuasion, Jane Austen's last novel. Uh, now, because it is her last novel, some say that it is her most mature novel, the one that uh, she, had, she wrote with the most skill and experience. And uh, we, can, we can talk about that. Uh, but we're going to read the entire novel. Again, I will give you a handout. Um, and we're going to read four chapters per week. Now again, it, it sounds like a lot, but Jane Austen's chapters are not that long. Uh, I finished chapter one in like five minutes. Of course, I'm an English teacher, so I read faster than you do. But it's still quite short. So four chapters per week. Now, before that, week 10, um, to sort of introduce you to the world of Jane Austen, we're going to watch a film based on a Jane Austen text. Uh, Love and Friendship is a quite recent film, 2016. Uh, it's based on a novel that, well, not a novel, a short novel, a novella, Tongpin, that Jane Austen wrote when she was, what, 14? And it's an epistolary novel, which means that the entire story takes place through letters that the characters write to each other. But the movie is much more interesting than just people reading letters. In fact, it's, it's kind of funny. 
and hopefully that will introduce you to uh, the world of Jane Austen and what people of that time period cared about in their daily life. Um, so movie and then six weeks of the novel. Week 17, uh, we're going to read just some poetry, five poems. Uh, all five poems have to do with the First World War. Now, uh, I don't know if you know this, but before the First World War, war was seen as a good thing. It was seen as a chance for soldiers to gain honor and glory, to fight for the home country, uh, to defeat the savage, brutal enemy, these kinds of ideas. But World War I is the first widespread war, like large-scale war, to use uh, things like machine guns, trench warfare, and at near the end of the war, there were even some tanks. And uh, as you might imagine, there is not a lot of glory and honor uh, when you charge against a machine gun versus charging against other soldiers. So the experience of the First World War uh, changed the Western world's ideas about war. And one of the most powerful ways that that change was communicated is through poetry. These poems, if you really pay attention to them when you read, are shocking, uh, they're heartbreaking, uh, they're very powerful poems. So we're going to spend one week reading those. Finally, week 18, final exam, uh, same as the midterm, uh, but the, the uh, exam will be about uh, the novel only. The poems are to give you a kind of break before the exam. Uh, and so that is the schedule. The percentages of your grade, 20% is attendance, 40% is midterm, 40% is final. But again, don't worry, uh, when I say each exam has 40 points, I'm not going to grade you from zero to 40. I'm going to grade you from like 29 to 40. There is a minimum to how much you will get as long as you remember to take the exam. Here's the thing. We're going to be reading a lot in this class, as you can see. But I'm hoping that uh, this is an elective course, so you're here because you're interested to a degree in what we're reading. So if you're not interested, I'm not going to force you to finish everything every week. As long as you uh, try your best on the exams, as long as you show up to class, you're not going to fail, okay? But if you like forget to take an exam, or if you miss too many classes, uh, I can't guarantee that you'll pass. That sounds about fair, right? Another reason that you will want to read as much as you can each week is because this class will mostly be based on group discussions. Each week, uh, I will come here and I will present with you, uh, you with some discussion questions. I will give, I will divide you into small groups later today. I will give each group a question, I'll let you discuss it, and then uh, we will share the answers with the entire class. And as you answer, discuss those questions, and as you give us your answers, uh, I will interact with your group and extend and deepen the answers that you give. Uh, and in that way, we can focus on uh, multiple detailed parts of the text that we read. Uh, and then if we have time left, I will go back and talk about uh, some other important parts uh, that we maybe had not talked about before. So if you don't read the text before you come to class, you won't, A, you won't know what's going on, and B, when it's your group's turn to answer a question, you will have nothing to say. Uh, so even if uh, you can't finish all the reading each week, 
please read as much as you can. Um, I'm not sure if you have had experience reading a lot of things in a very short time in English before. Uh, if you find this difficult, the best advice I can give you is this. Two points. One, try not to use a dictionary the first time. The best way to pick up a vocabulary is to learn the words in context, in the uh, meaning that it is used at that point in the text. English vocabulary is not determined by the writers of dictionaries. It is determined by the people who use the words. So if you can kind of figure out what the word means, but you're not quite sure, that's fine. Just take your guess and keep reading. But when you do get stuck, and you, you lose your way and nothing makes sense, then, of course, you should check a dictionary. And the dictionary that you should check is an English-to-English -English dictionary. Uh, we all know that there's always something lost in translation. But also, if you use a Chinese-language dictionary, like there are hundreds of Chinese language dictionaries are like, you know, like e-dictionaries that you can buy. But most of those products are based on the same two or three dictionaries. So in fact, uh, what you're really doing is you're looking to one set of experts on what this word means in translation. What if they get it wrong? For example, what is the difference between terror and horror. If you look at your English to Chinese dictionary, it will probably tell you it means kongju for both. But they're not the same. There's a reason that we call uh, scary movies horror films and not terror films. Horror has not only fear, it also has disgust. It makes you feel like it's disgusting, you want to stay away. So sometimes you'll watch something like a zombie movie that's not scary, but it's still called a horror film because it has zombies and like people killing zombies and blood and gore and things that people sometimes think are disgusting. But that's a difference that your English to Chinese dictionary will not tell you. Another reason you should always use an English to English dictionary, especially for this class, is because we are reading texts from before the 20th century, except for week 17. The way that people used language in those days can be very different from today. And if you look at an English to Chinese dictionary, it may not give you those meanings. For example, the word nice. Today it means like good, kind, fine, okay. It used to mean detailed, fastidious, discriminating, meticulous, attention to small differences. A completely different meaning. Another example, the word want. Today means, oh, you know what it means, like I want something, like I want to have it, right? It used to mean lack not having something, but not necessarily actually wanting that something. Does that make sense? This is, an, I, this is a meaning that you will probably not find in an English to Chinese dictionary. So I encourage all of you to use English to English dictionaries as much as you can. That's the first suggestion. The second suggestion is to take notes while you're reading. Uh, you can take notes about each paragraph or stanza. You can take notes about each scene or chapter. You can take notes at places where you think this is an important thing that you want to remember. The idea is when you're reviewing the text before the exam or you're trying to find some information in the text, you want to make it as easy to find as possible. So it's best to write like small summaries or small abstracts or like reminders of what's going on here or what's happening there. 
key points uh, as you're reading. So not just during or after class, but as you're reading before class. And this will help you, first of all, writing down these summaries will help you remember. But also when you go back and you have to look for something, it's faster to look at your summaries than to read the entire thing. So this is very important. Okay, so far, do you have questions? Uh, also, I'm offering the same course on Friday. If Friday works better for you, please come back on Friday. The two courses are exactly the same. In this course, as I mentioned, we will be dis discussing questions. Now, every I've already finished writing all the questions. Let me show you. This is oh no, this is this is the Moodle page. Uh, attendance, you can't see that. That's for me. Attendance is for me. Uh, okay, and then first unit, Faustus, Paradise Laws. I've already written all of these questions. Every single question is an open question. There is no such thing as a wrong answer. There are better answers, there are worse answers, but every answer can make sense to a degree. So you don't have to worry about getting it wrong because it is literally impossible to answer a question wrong in this class. So if there's no wrong answer, how do we tell if an answer is better or worse? Uh, the classical standard of uh, good and bad answers is the more evidence you can explain with your answer, and the better you can fit all of this evidence together in a way that makes sense, the better your answer is. So for example, if I ask you, uh, how would you describe this character? Very open question. You can answer this however you want. If you only focus on uh, this character's uh, like specific actions, like two or three things the character does, it will not be as good an answer as if you describe their actions, their mindset, their motivations, their backgrounds, because the second answer has more evidence. Now, of course, if you give me a lot of evidence, but you can't put it together, if you can't make all of the evidence uh, explain the same character, then it's not a good answer either. Uh, but even in such an answer, we can find uh, parts that we can continue to talk about. Uh, so it's not a wrong answer. It's just not as good as an answer that does make more sense. So hopefully, uh, with all of these open questions, um, you will not feel as much pressure to always have to get it right. Even when you get it completely as wrong as it is possible to get, I guarantee you we can still discuss your answer. I've been doing this for a few years. We can discuss your answer. Um, so just to make sure you understand, I'm not going to ask you things like, oh, when was this person born? Where do they live? What happens on page 32? These are closed questions. They have correct and incorrect answers. I'm going to ask you things like, how would you describe this character? This character says this. Do you agree? Why or why not? How do you know that this character is correct or not? Open questions, where there is more than one kind of answer. Because when we study literature, unlike when we study, I don't know, engineering. In engineering, if you get something wrong, the bridge collapses. But in literature, the more answers we have, the more different perspectives we have, the better we can understand what we are reading, and the more we can understand of life in general. Because literature is almost always about people, how they think, how they behave, why they behave this way. And there's, so there's a direct connection between what we read, how we think, and what our world looks like today. So that's what I hope we can uh, keep in mind when 
uh, we read and discuss in this class. Questions? Okay. Uh, let's see. What did I forget? I must have forgotten something. Okay, so these are the discussion questions. And then at the bottom, you have the exam space. Uh, the deadlines are always one week, uh, uh, on midnight, one week after the exam starts. The exam will start at the end of class on the previous week. It will go for seven days and then end on midnight. Okay, so you will have one week. Please do not use uh, only the last two days. If you have one week, I encourage you to make use of the entire week or to finish as quickly as you can, as early as you can. Now, since uh, all of our discussion questions in class will be open questions, uh, for the exams, they will, of course, also be open questions, but they will be bigger open questions. They will be questions that we may not spend a lot of time discussing in class, but it will have to do with the entire range of what the exam covers. Uh, so basically, if you, you have, start to get a sense of what this text is about, you will be able to answer the questions. Uh, and if you have been cutting class every week and then you want to try to pass the course, uh, it's not going to be easy to get a good score. Uh, as I said, as long as you take the exam, you will pass. But I'm sure that none of you want to pass with a 60.0. Uh, so again, I encourage you to read as much as you can each week. Uh, right, and when you do take the exam, as I said, it's open book. You can use whatever resources you can find. Uh, but if you have taken an open book exam before, you know there is a balance. The more resources you look for, the more time you will have to spend organizing your information, the less time you will have to write the answer. So there's a balance. And also, I'm not giving you a grade based on how much information you give me. I'm giving you a grade based on how much of the text you can talk about and make it all make sense together. So if you feel like you pretty much understand the question and uh, how to answer it, you don't need to look for resources. If student A gives me a clear, good answer with no outside resources, and student B uses a ton of resources but gives uh, an answer that doesn't quite make sense, student A will get a higher grade. So the open book idea, the idea of giving you resources is if you need it. Because this is not a memory exam, this is a thinking exam. Uh, but again, the fewer resources you, you look up and try to organize, the more time you will have to actually answer the question. Uh, and since you will be able to look up these resources, I must tell you not to plagiarize. Don't copy and paste. If you use outside resources, tell me which parts of your answer come from somebody else. Uh, it says here, if you use information from other sources, give me the name of the source, web address, if it has one, and page number, if it has one, in parentheses, guaha, after the part that you use. Uh, this is an exam about what you think. So if you use other people's ideas, that's not what you think, that's what they think. And the grade that I give you based on these ideas that you pretend are yours will not be your grade. You will, in fact, be stealing a grade from somebody else. Now, uh, in a university where people such as me, we do research and we do thinking, uh, the, the thinking itself is the important thing. So, 
if I go copy someone else's ideas and publish them as a research paper, it's the same thing as if I go to like a convenience store and steal a thousand NT. It's the same kind of crime. Stealing. Stealing something that has value. So don't do that. If I catch you stealing other people's ideas, I will give you a zero on the exam. And that's 40 points gone. So you probably won't pass. Clear? Again, if you're having trouble, you can look at other people's ideas and you can tell me this idea comes from someone else. That's fine. The, the wrong thing to do is to not tell me it is someone else's idea. And if you're still having trouble, you can always write to me to ask questions, even about the exam. And I will give you as much help as I think is fair. Uh, the design of this course is to help you understand uh, and learn from what we read in class. It is not to try to punish you or make it hard for you to pass. I really want to help you pass this course. Okay? Okay. Um, let's take attendance. I have seven people on my attendance sheet. So I'm just going to call your names. Zhang Haoyu, Huang Diping, Shen Pingquan, Shen Yisheng, Shen Yisheng, Ho Ho, Ling Dairong, Wang Junyu, Wang Junyu, Luo Jizhang. OK. Uh, so that means that everyone else is still thinking about whether to take this course. Uh, so the bottom line is if you take the course, you show up, you take the exam, you will get the credit. Uh, but how high a grade you want depends on how, uh, how hard you work at reading and at discussing each week. Okay? Um, if, okay, let's, let's divide you into groups, five groups per, uh, like five groups in this class. So, um, 我们我们来报数好不好？一到五。And uh, if you don't want to take this course, just pass. Okay, like say pass or say like push up, something like that. Okay. Okay.